right, today we're gonna to go over a review of how to import the UAV Tech trace templates. We're gonna do a quick overview of some of the buttons and knobs in Black Box Explorer. And then we're gonna talk about how to interpret the trace lines for the PID loop, P, I, and D, uh, also with feed forward as well, and how that all adds together into the PID sum. And it's really not that magical. And PID loops are really kind of simple, actually. It's just some subtraction and some multiplication, and that's it. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is go to your favorite browser and go to tiny.cc UAV Tech. Once you're there, go into this BBE Trace Templates. And before you even go there, if you wanted to get the latest nightly build of Betaflight Black Box Explorer, it has a new spectrograph feature in there where you can use a waterfall graph. If you are interested in that, you can go into this directory here, you can chase down through it and download just the installed uh, directory for Black Box Explorer. So you download that whole folder, put it on your desktop somewhere, and then run the Black Box Explorer from that location. And then you'll have what I'll show here on the screen here kind of at the end. So back in Trace Templates, there you'll see this UAV Tech BF JSON file, and also this Trace te Template Setup files. You're gonna go ahead and then download the JSON file, and then maybe even the PDF. The PDF will give you a couple little tips on what the Trace Templates are. So these are the number keys on your number keyboard, you know, above the letters, not your keypad. So one is a holistic flight performance, kind of looking at the uh, RC traces, the debug modes, gyros, so on and so forth, uh, pit operations, prop wash evaluation, uh, yaw, pitch, roll, and then noise, analysis. Some other little tips and tricks down here below. Okay, so back in Black Box Explorer, you want to open a log, any log, and then go ahead, I'm going to expand this out. You want to hit the open file dialog, and then you're going to browse to your JSON file and go ahead and click on that and load it. I'm not going to click on the JSON file, but you can figure that out. Go browse to wherever you download it, click on it, and just hit open to load it. I already have it loaded here, so if I go ahead, you're not going to see any differences until you press a number on your number keyboard after it loads. It doesn't really do anything until you start to press numbers. So if I press one, you can see it, it sets me to these trace templates here. Again, going back to these setup templates here, I usually spend most of my time under setup number zero and setup number three. This gives you a nice evaluation of noise. You can run some spectrographs. This gives you a nice normalizing of how close the gyro is following set point. Set point is where you're moving your sticks to, and then gyro is you know, going to follow that. The PID loop is what pushes it to follow that. Trace setup three kind of normalizes that, so it, it makes some sense. And you'll see in my videos, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth here, but you'll see in my videos refer to these a lot. So hopefully you'll get a sense through that. And I just wanted to do this video to get an overview of how to download this stuff, kind of follow along. I use uh, Trace Setup 9, 8, and 7 if I'm looking at specific things on roll, pitch, or y'all. And uh, 1 and 2, honestly, I don't use that much at all. 2 I hardly ever use. Uh, 1 very, uh, very sporadically. So going into Trace Setup 0 here, you can see I have the raw noise, then the filtered gyro signal. So to get the raw noise, you have to record in your black box debug mode gyro underscore scaled, and then that will give you that raw noise. So starting from the basics here, just kind of going across the top. If you want to see the header file in your log, you go ahead and click this, and this will show you the current PIDs for this flight and some of the D min settings and some of your filter setup down here, which features were on and off. And if you get blank values in here, your log is a little corrupted. If you have a Matek board in Betaflight 4.0, I know that was something that was fixed in Betaflight 4.0.3, so you may want to upgrade to 4.0.3 just for that. If these values are blank, you could have weird scaling in like your debug values or something like that. So, you know, do not just totally ignore that. It's something that you might want to bring up as an issue on the Black Box Explorer uh, GitHub site. If, like I said, if you're getting blank values here. The next thing you can do is look at the raw values. So these are the actual raw values from the log itself. Some of these are calculated fields, like for example, pit error is a calculated field. So it's the, you know, it's the set point minus where the gyro is, and you know, set point in degrees per seconds because that's what you're commanding with your rates. And then it's this, the gyro is also in degrees per seconds of what the quad is actually rolling or pitching or yawing. And if you look at pit error, pit error is just the difference between those two. You know, where is it supposed to be? Where is it actually at? The differential is what pit error is. Little arrows up here, just turn on the little craft or not. If you have the accelerometer enabled, you'll see this thing flip and roll around. If you don't, it will just always be static, but you can see kind of what the motor traces are doing here. A uh, little pictograph there. This is your 
com stick commands here, which is really just your RC commands. Uh, this is to turn on and off the spectrum analyzer. So the spectrum analyzer looks at these little vibrations. So you can see on this trace here. So one tip is if I, on any trace setups, if I hit the little minus button here, then it will zoom me in to look at just that trace template. If I click it again, it takes me back. So clicking on here, and you can see in here all these vibrations on the gyro signal from the motor vibrations, and then that gets filtered down with the Betaflight filtering to what goes into the PID loop, and you can see how this line is, is smoother here. So a spectrograph that it runs, it really just gives a, a plot for us to kind of digest the information, because when you're looking at this, there's you know, a lot of wiggly jiggly lines here, and it's like, well, uh, what frequency is this? And frequency basically means spacing from peak to peak. What frequency is that? What is the amplitude at one frequency versus another frequency? You can kind of scrub it, but it, it, you know, just like any graph in Excel, it's, it's hard to digest uh, without kind of getting a holistic view. So if I look here, if I hold down Alt, for example, and use the arrows on my keyboard, I can go one loop iteration at a time. So if you look down here, this number, this is the loop iteration, so I can just go up by one at a time here. And uh, if I go to here and I press M for mark point, and then I go to the next one, you can see that that vibration you know, the spacing from top to top, peak to peak is 330 hertz. Well, if I do a spectrograph of that trace by clicking on the legend here, you can see I have more, uh, my two peaks on this specific trace, there's two peaks where the amplitude when the spacing is around, I don't know, 375, you can use this spacer to kind of slide things out here and put it over one of these numbers here. I wish it was a little easier, but it can be done. Uh, you can see it's around, I don't know, 330 hertz. The amplitude is more, and then over here, the amplitude, and the amplitude is top to bottom. You can see on here, top to bottom. That's what that amplitude is. So you can kind of see that I have, you know, that you have all these wiggles in your traces, your vibrations on your what the gyro is reading, and the amplitude of those is higher at certain hertz values than at others. Well, that's because of frame mechanical and electrical stuff. So that's what that shows you, and that's what filtering combats. So you can see here, that's the raw noise, and after the filtering, bam, all those peaks go away. That's what the dynamic notch is doing, and that's what you want to be checking for to make sure that your uh, raw to filter trace, that you're getting those peaks taken care of with the gyro filtering. So with that, you can see I zoomed up here. You also can play, go, go ahead and play it forward. You can do it at 100% or lower. You could always go into here and hit load log or video. So you could have a video in MP4 format and bring that into the log. And that would kind of be as a background here. If you go into the question mark up here, you can hit shortcut and you can see that all the different shortcut things you can use here to line up a video, for example, if you do M for marked point on where like the quad arms and then you use your arrows and Alt key to get where the video actually starts and then you hit Alt M, that will sync the two things together. So I'm not going to do that here just for speed of showing some stuff, but uh, that's what that's for. So take a look at all this help through here. There's all kinds of shortcut keys that you can use. Uh, with using the legend and, and so on and so forth. If you wanted to narrow the spectrograph to a certain point in flight, so say you have, like you can see here, this is throttle value along the bottom, and right here I'm just doing some normal forward flight, and you can say, well, I have this section of my flight where it's, you know, it's kind of bobbly. Uh, normally what I would do is kind of narrow the spectrograph down and say, okay, well, I don't want to look at all the noise uh, in a spectrograph. I just want to look where I'm doing this nice steady flight, you can use the I and O keys. So if I bring the I key, if I take this red marker in the middle here and I go to a certain spot in the log and I hit I, it moves and kind of trims this off. It doesn't trim the data, but you can, it's not kind of going to look at it for the spectrograph. If I hit I again, that goes back to the beginning. So if I hit I and then I again, you can see it goes back, kind of narrows that view down. You can use the zoom percentage and you can kind of see that. Uh, I'm only looking at this small section. And then when I do a spectrograph, it's only looking at that isolated spot. So you can say, hey, on my, you know, I'm trying to cruise and just forward flight. What are my vibrations at? And you can see it's right here. The peak is at 268. So you know, it just happens to be where my motors are. That's where the vibrations are. In the latest version of Black Box Explorer, the latest nightly build, there's you can change this frequency to frequency versus throttle, and it brings up a waterfall graph of whatever the spectrograph is. So this one we have on screen here doesn't show 
the current, the one we were just looking at doesn't show uh, based on throttle percentage, but this one does. So here the amplitude is measured by how hot this is or how white. And then you can see the Hertz value here, and then you can see the throttle value. So in this section of flight, I was in between, I don't know, 30, 30% and uh, 50, 55% throttle. And uh, you can see the, where that motor peak is here. And then you can adjust the intensity of that just for visualization purposes. And you can stretch this back and forth just as well. Up here, you can turn on and turn off what filters it's kind of showing, which is, this is really nice to see since this is a dynamic low pass filter. You can see it starts here at, at this percent throttle. And then as it goes up to 100% throttle, this is where the cutoff is for that low pass filter, that dynamic low pass filter. Down here at the bottom, you have three icons. One is Expo, so this is important. If I wanted to look at specifically the roll axis in this scenario, and I wanted to look at a specific, you know, hard roll, zero throttle, just doing a hard roll to the right. And I look at that trace with this, uh, there's a thing in Black Box Explorer where it's Expo, where it just kind of takes the traces and stretches them vertically to give a, you know, a little bit better resolution on, on what you're seeing. But to get a really a one-to-one -one resolution, you want to turn that expo off, and that's what's actually happening on a one-to-one -one scenario. So that's useful sometimes. You can see if you're really threading the needle here, like this slope-up line doesn't really look like that. It actually looks more gradual like that. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, smoothing is the next one. If you turn on or off smoothing, that will smooth out these lower traces or the ones that actually have smoothing applied into them. So you can see here, if I go into my P-term traces here and then turn on smoothing, you can see it makes it look smoother than it actually is. It kind of takes the vibrations out. That's useful sometimes if you're trying to say, well, I'm trying to really thread the needle and look at something very specific and you just don't want to see those vibrations. You want to kind of see the average of what the signal is through here. Yeah, you, know, you can use that. The next one is the grid lines. The grid lines are, are helpful to see how Expo is really working. So you can see here's a normal distribution uh, on the vertical axis. And then when you turn on Expo, you can see how the grid lines, how that works, how it's stretching out that first uh, I guess square a grid and then as you go farther out it's it's not stretching it out as much so it's kind of a uh, exponential stretch I guess through here I don't know I don't turn this on much uh, mostly I just have the expo on all the time just so I can see things a little bit uh, at a higher fidelity you can adjust any of the trace templates by going into the graph setup and you can make your own here delete some so for example if I want to delete a couple of these and then hit save changes just to kind of clean it up a little bit that will you know change it to whatever you had set there you can always go back and hit zero to bring it back to the trace template that we had previously the setup here you can add a new graph whenever you want you can add a custom graph this is kind of trace templates themselves like if, if i bring in motors it will bring in you know make a new graph it will call it motors it will put motors in there as number one and then when i hit save on this one now we'll add all four motors so the other thing you can do is go up here and add custom graph. You can always puts it at the bottom and I could call this whatever uh, PID sum, which I could bring one in. It's called PID sum that would have all that in there, but I could bring this in manually. And if I pick this one at the top, it's going to bring in the roll picture y'all. If I only wanted to see the roll, I would just click on roll. But let's just do the top one. And then you can see when I actually hit save on that one, it's actually going to bring in all four. You can move graphs around by clicking on this graph and just dragging it up. So say, for example, you wanted to have the pitch above roll for something that you're looking at. I don't know. You can do that. Hit save. And then you can see we now have that change. Again, if I then click on my trace template uh, zero again, it's going to all switch back to what it was um, prior to making any of those adjustments. If I did want to change the setup and wanted to save that, I go ahead and hold down shift and press zero and then that would lock that into the trace template. You could always uh, re-import the UAV tech one or, or go ahead and export your own through the export workspace. Also if you wanted to just take the raw values and push them into Excel you could export to CSV and open this in Excel and then do whatever graphing you would like. If you want to open a new instance of Black Box Explorer you can go ahead and click new window and that will bring up another instance where you can open up a separate log. And basically that's it to give you enough of the run through of how to use Black Box Explorer. I wanted to take this time to kind of look at the PID loop quick and then just show you something on that. So I'm going to go to Trace Setup 3 here, which I talked about is the PID error and then the P and D. 
So if I look at this here, and we're gonna look at just one axis. So I wanna go into trace setup nine, which is gonna be my roll, and I'm gonna use a sharp roll just to show kind of how the PI and D work, because I think people will kind of overthink how these things operate, and it's the PID loop on all firmware is, is very simple. So we're gonna go ahead and look at this trace here. We're gonna expand this one out, and we kind of take a look at this. I'm gonna do a little simplification here. We don't really need to look at raw noise. That just kind of clutters it up, so let's go take that out. And then, you know, let's just look what we got here. So you can kind of use these graphs up top here. I, I'm bringing down throttle to zero right here, and then I'm starting to do a sharp roll to the right. Well, this green line is set point. So that's my commanded roll rate on my rates to move the quad to a roll. And you can see that's kind of ramping up. Now, what happens is here, you start to get a deviation. So if I zoom in here, you can see this is the uh, gyro. The gyro is generally tracking the set point. It's not right perfectly on it. This was a really windy day, honestly. Uh, so it's not perfectly on it, but as this starts to roll to the right, the quad is, it needs something to tell it to do that. So the PID loop starts to react. There's a couple values that push it to roll to the right. So you can see they're, if they're pushing in the same direction as the set point, which would be up here, that's pushing the gyro to go that direction. So you can see the first thing is feed forward is pushing it. The next thing is the P term. So the P term is the pushing term. It's basically measuring the differential between the set point and where the gyro is and saying, okay, there's a difference there. You basically take in this specific spot, we're going to take 45 degrees per second minus 27 degrees per second. That's a difference. That difference, we're gonna multiply by the PID gain and proportionally push the quad to spin up the motors. On the left-hand side, you can see here, to start to enter into the roll. Feed forward is also making a push, and that's not based on the differential of the set point to where the gyro's at, that's based on stick, the acceleration of your stick. So the faster you move the stick, it multiplies that kind of like a mouse accelerator by a gain, which is your feed forward gain, to also push. So it kind of helps the P term push a craft into a turn. And feed forward in this scenario is too, too low. That's why this gyro trace is not following the set point. So this is an untuned quad. This is best based on defaults, but there's two things that are too low here. The P term's too low, and the gains, and also feed forward's too low. Uh, we, there, I have videos on, on tuning that kind of stuff. The D term here, you can see, is actually opposing the craft to follow the set point, because the D term opposes all motion of the gyro. So when the gyro tries to go one way, the D term says, nope, I'm gonna push that the other way. The other term in here is the I term, and the I term is basically just trying to offset uh, bias in the quad. So if I have, uh, you know, the bat, like right here, you can see this is just normal steady flight throughout here, and you can see how this I term is really low, or it's kind of below the zero line here. That means that the that means that the quad is heavy to the right side of it, so the I term is pushing it back to the left side. So that's just an imbalance in the quad. That's what the I term is there for, to account for kind of imbalances in your battery placement or just in general, like, I don't know, there's just some sort of bias that's there all the time. So the I term moves to adjust that so that this can, that your gyro can stay right on the set point. Now going in here and bringing in the PID sum, so that's just PIDs, hit that, hit save, save changes here. You can literally see that now, again, we're looking on the roll axis up here specifically. This is the gyro plus PIDs on the roll. So we really don't need these other values on the PID sum. We can just isolate that down to looking at here. And the PID sum is literally the sum of these values. So if I take 10.5 plus 1.6 plus negative 2.7 plus 4.6 for feed forward, I will get 14, exactly all the time, you know, you just add these values up and that's what your PID sum is. That PID sum feeds to the mixer. The mixer figures out what motors it needs to spin up for to induce a right-hand roll of positive 21% on the to on the right side, which it knows is the left two motors and would, would speed them up equally in an X configuration and then that causes it to roll. So it's very simple math. You can see that the you know, the P, I, and D are just proportional, the P is proportional difference between the set point and the gyro multiplied by a gain.
feet forward is looking at the slope of a line based on how fast you move the sticks, multiplying that by a gain. The I term is just reading a, a general bias on the gyro following the set point and adjusting, multiplied by a gain. And then the D term is the slope of the gyro signal here multiplied by a gain. So the steeper this is, the farther the D term goes out and how far that is adjustable by the D gain. That's just added together into the pit sum, pushed to the mixer, and that's what controls the whole thing and how it flies. All copters that fly with a pit loop do exactly this. So it's really not you know, any more complicated than a bunch of addition and subtraction and some multiplication. If we wanted to look at the uh, pit error on this, it's a specific spot. So you know, we're looking right here on trace setup nine. I'm gonna go to trace setup three, and I'm just gonna look at the roll access here. Here you can see this is the pit error. So the pit error again is the, it's kind of, when you're looking at pit error, it's, it's normalized by, it's, it's just doing that math already where you have the set point minus the gyro. So when, I guess the best way to say it is when you're looking at pit error, the ideal craft would always have zero pit error. That would mean the gyro is exactly tracking the set point all the time. And you'll see your biggest pit error is always when you enter into a sharp move. Now again, in this craft, it's not tuned, so when I enter into a sharp move for roll or pitch, you, can, you saw the lag from the gyro following the set point, so the pit error spikes like crazy. We, through tuning, we will reduce that so that doesn't happen much at all, if any. There's always going to be some in sharp moves because it's a very violent thing to start to take something that's quads are, five inch quads are honestly pretty heavy, you know, 600 grams, and then make that move at 1,000 degrees per second. Uh, and then make it stop. That's a, that's a very violent thing that occurs. So to get absolute zero pit error through that whole process is very difficult. But the same thing for prop wash. As you go into prop wash, you'll see your pit error jump up and down. Um, that's what trace setup three is really for. So you can kind of normalize that and you're not trying to kind of do that in your head as you're following the traces go up and down as you're moving left and right. You know, how far is this off of the zero line? This is my amount of differential between the gyro following the set point. It also makes it a little easier to see how the PID loop is reacting to pushing the, the quadcopter to keep that gyro on the set point. So you'll see here if I take a look at a section of prop wash, and I can see right here that as my vi it's you know kind of vibrating to the it's oscillating to the right in prop wash, the P term is pushing it back down to get back on track uh, as this is going back down to the set point, the uh, D term here is trying to make sure that it doesn't overshoot, so it's kind of pushing against that, so it doesn't just keep going past it, and then that operation goes goes through here. And, and again, that's in more tuning videos that I show, I just wanted to kind of get some fundamentals of how the PID loop uh, works and how it's very basic math, and it's, you know, when you look at these traces, so it's not so scary. It does take some time to digest it all, but Nevertheless, hopefully this video helps with some of that. Okay, well that was it. Thanks everybody, and I hope this helped.